I'll be handing across to Andrew Cornford to introduce our two speakers for today. Okay, hi everyone. Um, as Andy says, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew Cornford. I'm part of the criminal law subject area here in the law school. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our speakers for today, uh, professors James Chalmers and Fiona Leverick from the University of Glasgow. Uh, really glad that they're joining us today, uh, not just because I'm a, a big fan of their work, um, but also because they're gonna be talking to us about this uh, fascinating and important research that they've done on decision making by uh, Scottish juries uh, in conjunction with uh, Vanessa Munro as well from the University of Warwick and uh, Ipsos Murray. So the usual practice that we have is um, our speakers will present for uh, around 45 minutes uh, and then we'll have any time that's left over after that for Q&A, uh, so we'll finish at uh, two o'clock. So there should be plenty of time for questions, hopefully, and when we get to that point in the session, uh, I'll say a bit about the uh, protocol for, for yeah, asking questions and so on. So yeah, without any further ado, I think James is gonna kick off with the first part of the presentation. So I'll hand over to him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll just, um, if you give me a second, I'll just share the screen with our presentation now. And hopefully everyone can see that. So yes, uh, um, as Andrew said, I'll be uh, presenting the first part of, of this presentation and, and Fiona will um, do, do the second half. Thank you very much uh, to, to Andrew and to Andy for the, for the invitation to do this. It's, it's really, uh, great to be able to do this finally, as I think some of you know, this should have happened many months ago, but the, 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 there was this virus apparently that made it difficult to do these sorts of things, so uh, we're, we're grateful to be uh, doing it in this virtual format now. This is a project that was run over a couple of years, funded by the Scottish Government. It was led by Ipsos Mori Scotland, uh, I'll explain a bit more about the, the, the role that, that they had uh, later on. And there were three academics involved, myself and Fiona, and also Vanessa Monroe from the University of Warwick. Okay. So going to look at uh, these various things, why we did, uh, did it, how we did it, uh, and uh, going through the findings. We will also talk here, some of you may be familiar with the uh, report that has come out of the jury research project itself. There's a little bit more work that we've done since on how our juries dealt with rape cases in particular, and the, the deliberations in those cases. And that's one of the things which Fiona will talk about in the second half of the, the research. And that's material which uh, we, we hope will be published in the near future, but it isn't all in the public domain as yet. Okay. So why we did it, first of all? Well, there is lots and lots of jury research out there. there. There's a huge number of jury research studies. But one problem is that the Scottish jury is, to use a technical term, really weird. So we have a jury that comprises 15 members rather than 12, as would be the case in most English-speaking jurisdictions. Uh, they reach verdicts by a simple majority, eight votes required for a conviction. Most systems say you need unanimity or something pretty close to that. We, we don't do that. So Scottish juries never hang. They always reach a verdict of one form or another. And perhaps best known and perhaps most significant, they have three verdicts. They have uh, the option of acquitting with a not guilty verdict, but also a not proven verdict. Uh, we can talk more about the history of that, that and why it's there if people want uh, later on. But perhaps the key point here is this is not a verdict that has formally any different legal definition. Juries are simply told, you've got two verdicts of acquittal, and if you want to acquit, it's up to you which of those two you prove. Now, the background to what we were being asked to do here was that the Scottish government some time ago now had proposed to remove another really weird feature of Scots law, the requirement of corroboration in criminal cases. Nobody can be convicted of a criminal offence with minor exceptions unless there are two sources of evidence pointing to their guilt. That was controversial. Uh, that led to a review called the Post-Corroboration Safeguards Review to look at, okay, if we abolish corroboration, 
abolish that requirement? What other changes should we make to the system? And that review concluded that it could not make final recommendations regarding uh, potential change because it didn't really know how the jury worked. Despite there being about 1,500 published jury research studies worldwide, we don't know very much about what difference these unique features of the Scottish just, uh, justice system might make. Uh, there, there are a few, uh, were a few prior, uh, very uh, small scale, uh, not terribly realistic studies because realistic jury research is expensive. So you couldn't use the, the research that, that was there to draw conclusions about the Scottish jury because you were always running up against the question, yes, but does this work differently in Scotland because we have these unique features. So we want to, to find out what, what's going on in Scotland. Now, I think in some ways what uh, a lot of people wanted here was, we just want to know how the Scottish jury works. We just want to know everything about it. That of course is not how a research study can uh, in fact operate. And so research questions had to be identified. That was done not by us, but because this was a competitively tendered piece of research, but by the Scottish government in deciding what it wanted to put out to tender. Uh, and there, there has been, I think this audience might be, might be less cynical, but when we've done presentations about this research to practitioners in particular, there often is a sense of, oh, yes, but what did the Scottish government ask you to find? Uh, what, what was actually going on here? What was the agenda? And there wasn't one. We, we, we weren't being put under pressure to find something in particular. The Scottish Government does have quite good practices in terms of separating out the management of a research project like this from the policy involved. So the civil service involved in policy and the, the justice section themselves were at arm's length at all times. We were being managed by people um, from justice and analytical services who themselves didn't have a stake in the policy questions but were there to make sure we actually uh, conducted a rigorous piece of research. <coughs> so, excuse me. So the questions that <coughs> we were asked were just, first of all, more general question, what effect do these three features have on jury reasoning and decision making? And, uh, and that's what I will talk about uh, in my part of the presentation. Secondly, how do jurors understand that they're not proven verdict and why might they choose this over another verdict? Fiona will talk about that. And also our research does shed light on some other issues memory and understanding of, of, of legal tests, which we'll both, I think, say, say a bit about incidentally, and jury deliberations in rape cases, which Fiona will talk about specifically towards the end. We do not, in the research report, make recommendations about what, if anything, should change. That was not the function of the research. We were, in fact, explicitly asked not to do this. We are, of course, like anyone else, entitled to have views on that, but that, but that wasn't part of the research project itself. Again, we may come on to some of our views, uh, particularly in the discussion later on. Okay. So how we went about doing this? Okay. Well, we ran 64 mock juries. Okay. The, the starting point here was that we had to prepare two simulated trials. So we scripted a, a rape trial and we scripted an assault trial. There obviously had to be a sexual assault trial in here because there are particular concerns about sexual offence cases in the courts and particularly the use of the not proven verdict but at the same time we couldn't only use uh, a sexual assault trial because that would of course just uh, give rise to the question well is, is that different do juries use the not proven verdict in a special way in uh, rape trials for, for example so one rape trial one serious assault trial um, those scripts were uh, torn apart in very helpful ways by uh, an advisory group, including judges and, and, and petitioners, to, to tell us that's not what anybody would actually say in court, but they could say this instead. So we, we had, by the end, what we were satisfied was a reasonably realistic trial within the confines of what you can do in one hour. Of course, one hour in a nice, um, neatly filmed trial with absolutely no interruptions, delays, things going missing uh, is equivalent to perhaps a rather longer period of court time, but still obviously shorter than uh, an actual trial. And there were two baseline films, uh, as it were, but at the end of the films, there was the very final part of the judge's directions about how the jury should reach a verdict. Does it have to be unanimous? Um, did, it, uh, did it have two verdicts or three? So in the end, there, there was quite a large number of different uh, file, uh, different uh, videos, 16 different videos in total. 
uh, and we chose the, the appropriate one depending on the combination of those conditions that you can see in the, the, uh, the second bullet point, whether it was a rape or assault trial, whether there were two or three verdicts, whether there were 12 or 15 jurors and what was the majority required. The jury was played the appropriate video and then they had up to 90 minutes to deliberate, uh, quite a long period by uh, the standards of, of this kind of research. That deliberation was uh, both filmed and recorded uh, on audio. They returned a verdict if they were able to, uh, obviously if they were uh, deliberating under a condition of unanimity, they might not have been able to, and some juries there, then hung. And so we had those deliberations to analyse. We also had questionnaire data that the jurors had produced. They filled it a very short questionnaire before deliberations. Really at that point, all we wanted to know was what their initial verdict preference was, because we wanted to track how that changed during deliberations. Much more detailed questionnaire at the end of deliberations, asking about a, a whole range uh, of things, and we'll We'll come on to some of those things uh, during the course of the presentation. Ipsos Mori's expertise was, was crucial here, partly just in managing a, a huge research project uh, li like this. They, they were absolutely fantastic to, to work with. And as I say, they, they led the project, although um, Vanessa Field and I obviously led the, the legal aspects of, of, of it, as it were, because the Ipsos Mori researchers are not lawyers by background. And the one thing that they did, which is crucial here, was recruiting a representative selection of the public. So they recruited jurors by a mix of door-to-door -door and, and street recruiting in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh to a, a profile broadly similar to that of, of the Scottish population. We don't have research data about the representativeness of juries in Scotland compared to the population, unfortunately. There is English data that suggests it's, it's actually pretty good. Uh, but the main thing that uh, we were trying to do here is ensure that the composition of juries was reasonably consistent between each experiment. So when you got changes in verdicts, uh, those were changes because of the changes in the conditions, the, again, the, the points in the second bullet point, and not just because you happen to have a different sort of group of people in any one experiment you, you were running. Okay. There are massive limitations to this sort of research. Okay? And we, we acknowledge those in, in the report, uh, and I think some of this will be fairly obvious, but it's worth running through them. First of all, and most importantly, jurors know that they are role playing. They know that nobody is going to go to jail as a result of their verdict. Um, the advantage of analysis, of course, is by using a similar trial, it, rather than interviewing real jurors after criminal cases, for, for example, you are ensuring that they're all dealing with exactly the same case. So you can measure changes as you vary the conditions. Although it's, um, it's role playing, I mean, we can't control for the, the effect of that. Uh, you, you can't lie to jurors and say this is a real trial and that somebody is going to go, go to jail. Um, we find that jurors took it very seriously. They, they bought into it. They suspended disbelief without any real difficulty. And you can see that very clearly in their deliberations. My, my, my favorite example of this, but it's one of many examples, is in one of the deliberations in the simulated rape trial, where a juror explained that they believed the complainer because when she had said something in particular, if we give evidence, well, you, you could tell she was telling the truth. Nobody is that good an actor. They're all actors. Yeah? Everybody except the judge, the, uh, the, the judge who you saw in the picture on, on the first slide, Lord Bonamy, uh, was a real judge. Um, again, one of my, my favourite moments is when we ran rehearsals of the trials early on to, to test and them and tweak them uh, before a, a focus group. We did ask one juror after, or ask all the jurors afterwards, did you think this was realistic? And, and one juror uh, said, uh, she thought everybody was, was very realistic, except the, except the judge. You could tell it was his first day, but he, he, would, he would probably get better with a bit of practice. So there was buy-in. We had a bit of a problem. Fundamentally, they did know it was an experiment. Sample size is a limitation. It's a very big project, the biggest mock jury project ever carried out in the UK, although there are ones that are very close in size. But you still only have 64 juries. You still only have 64 data points for the verdict. At the same time, you have a much larger number of, of data points for individual juror verdict preferences, 863 participants, and that does give you a greater possibility to track statistically significant differences. And differences in juror verdict preferences will, of course, translate into verdicts. What we can't tell you is exactly how much uh, difference these will make. And that reflects the, the third point on the, on the screen as well, the fact that we were using specific trials. So we can tell you 
about what jurors did with the finely balanced trials that we have produced. We deliberately produced trials which were weighed slightly towards acquittal because we wanted jurors to be thinking about where they had the choice of free verdicts, which acquittal verdict was appropriate. So we got, as you would expect, a relatively high acquittal rate. That was by design. We can't therefore quantify if you got rid of not proven, for example, you would get this many convictions in the courts. We can tell you about the direction of travel with a reasonable degree of confidence, but we can't tell you any more than that. Okay, so looking first of all at how the unique features of the Scottish system impacted verdict choice. Okay. At the jury level, uh, most of our juries acquitted. Um, seven did, did convict, 26 not guilty verdicts, 26 not proven verdicts, and seven hung. Almost all juries that had the option of not proven and chose to acquit used the not proven verdict. Um, but nothing here was statistically significant. The, the numbers just aren't big enough uh, to allow us to, to draw conclusions that are, are statistically significant. I shouldn't say that so often when I can't pronounce it. But there were significant differences at the level of individual jurors. Okay. So, first of all, 15 person uh, uh, and 12 person juries. Now, as you would expect, the, the verdict preferences um, before deliberation are, are not massively different because it would be a bit weird if just sitting in a different size of group of people affected what you thought about the case, but you can see that there were differences after deliberation. So 15 person juries were much less likely uh, to switch to acquittal than, to, to, uh, than uh, jurors in the 12 person jury. Yeah. Now, we can only speculate as to exactly why that might be. It might be that our trials were biased towards acquittal anyway, so if you were going to, to reach a verdict, that was mostly a verdict of acquittal. You need more, more jurors to shift in the 15-person jury. Maybe there's less motivation to shift. Maybe it's easier to stick with your initial uh, verdict. We can't guarantee that this would work the same way with shifts towards conviction and trials that were more biased towards conviction, because leniency bias may mean that people are more likely, more comfortable with switching towards an acquittal. Majority required, uh, where jurors were asked to reach a simple majority verdict after deliberations, they were more likely to still favor a, gu a guilty verdict than those asked to reach uh, a unanimity verdict. Okay? Um, again, more of a shift in the, in the unanimity, because the shift, the shift matters. In a simple majority jury, the jury could return a verdict straight away. None of them actually did, even when there's a clear majority, they always deliberated for, for some time. Um, but unanimity, you typically required, in fact, I think in all our experiments, no, uh, well, they were, had to all, always reach unanimity, first of all, no jury was unanimous right at the start. Um, some got there, some got to a qualified majority where they were given permission to return a verdict with some dissenters later on. If they had it reached, a, uh, got to unanimity after an hour, the, the judge or a little video of the judge would say, okay, I can now accept 10 out of 12 or, or 13 out, out of 15. So a greater tendency there to, to shift uh, in the unanimity juries, again, uh, maybe less likely to shift towards a majority for, for guilty. We, we did have some evidence of that. Number of verdicts, perhaps, I think the point that's going to be, be of, of most interest. As I've said, of the, the three verdict juries, almost all of those juries who acquitted returned a not proven verdict, which does seem to suggest that where you have a finely balanced trial like this one, where it's not clear cut, then there's a strong preference for using the not proven verdict rather than the not guilty verdict. But the really interesting thing here is jurors' preferences right at the start before they even deliberated. Um, and in fact, deliberation didn't change this. At the start, juries at the end of the trial, if they had not proven available, 28% of them favoured guilty. If they didn't have not proven available, 38% of them favoured guilty. Now this strictly speaking, should not happen. Because what juries are being asked to do by the judge is ask, first of all, is this case proven beyond reasonable doubt? If it's pro proven beyond reasonable doubt, then you convict. Only if you don't convict, you think about which of the acquittal verdicts you want. The fact that you have two verdicts of acquittal doesn't change the reasonable doubt standard, but it clearly does change what jurors are doing. Uh, in thinking about, about the case. Clearly, uh, the uh, statistics here, uh, reasonably st uh, strong, strong difference. Uh, juries, jurors, individual jurors have a 
uh, I'd like to have a different variant preference, I may have a different variant preference, if they have the option of not probing. So how do these interact? Well, all these features make a difference. Uh, we, we did look at the various combinations, uh, quite a lot of combinations are obviously possible here. What was quite interesting uh, is that the combination of features that produced the, the most jurors in favour of conviction uh, was the 15 person simple majority to verdict jury. Now, no system in the world looks like that, but that's exactly what we would have in Scotland if you abolished not proven but made no other changes. So this does suggest that if you simply abolish not proven but did nothing else, you would have a system that was unusually inclined towards conviction uh, in comparative perspective. That's I think, as, as much as we can say there. Okay, okay uh, I want to talk about then about how juries reach decisions before handing over to, to Fiona. Uh, I'll try and uh, go through this relatively quickly because I, th I think about for anything else, uh, the parts that Fiona's going to speak about are the parts that are going to be of more interest. But we looked at how the de deliberation process ran uh, within juries and we looked at uh, a number of different things listed on this slide. Okay. Uh, some of these things, juror competence satisfaction measured by uh, questionnaire data, um, the, the others are measured by observation. Okay. These are the, the legal tests that they had to um, discuss in, um, in juries. Obviously all cases, both proof and corroboration were crucial. In the rape trial, they had to think about, did they claim consent? What's the legal definition of consent? Did the accused have a reasonable belief in consent? And the assault trial that we'd given them had a self-defense plea. So they, they, they had to consider the, the self-defense um, criteria. <laughs> now, what we did find is that in terms of the discussion of the legal tests and issues, there wasn't really any difference. As again, small number of data points, you would expect this, between whether juries discussed the specific legal issues across these various conditions, except that it did appear that where juries did not have the option of not proven, their minds were focused a bit more on the reasonable doubt standard. They talked more about what it was that reasonable doubt actually meant. Okay. You might think at first that's a good thing, we want jurors to talk about that. The problem was they didn't necessarily get it right. Um, so a lot of what was said about not proven in this context was actually quite different from the direction given by the judge. However, in the difference of a more exacting standard, so if, if your primary concern here is avoiding wrongful conviction, not a concern because they tend to bolster the standard. The judge told them, as Scottish judges are always would, reasonable doubt is something less than certainty, but jurors uh, like percentages in particular, they, they, they like formulations like 100% certain, any doubt whatsoever, which is not what the judge tells them, you've got to give them the benefit of that doubt. So they, they really enhance the standard. But the interesting thing was they talked about it more, but they didn't have the option of not proven to use. With the uh, individual uh, legal tests, um, assault, uh, the assault trial was the, the case where they, they really struggled uh, with the um, legal test they were being asked to apply. Self-defense in Scotland has, Scotland has a three-part test that was given to them by the judge, given to them orally because it's not the practice in Scotland to give directions uh, in writing uh, normally, and jurors clearly struggled with that. They actually got the basics, they, they understood what, what was at stake here was did this person behave reasonably? They, they, they got that. But they were not going step by step through the test in the way that judicial directions would suggest that they ought to. Corroboration, there was less evidence of, of misunderstanding, uh, despite a lot of attention that's focused on, on corroboration. Although again, the, the test was um, again overstated often by some jurors in rape trial, suggesting uh, that the doctor's evidence would have to be unequivocal in order to corro uh, corroborate. Although, uh, so, some jurors did uh, push back against that. They, they had evidence in the case from the prosecution, from both the complainer herself and uh, a medical examiner and evidence from the, the accused in his own defense. Uh, and rape trial, they, they talked most about complainers account rather than the law. Again, Phil will speak more about rape trials later. Juror participation, um, not going to go through this in detail, but essentially juror participation, a bit more problematic in the larger juries, more juries dominating discussions, more uh, jurors um, who we saw trying to contribute being unable to, more jurors who just didn't really contribute beyond very, very minor seeing what their vote was type contributions. Jurors themselves thought they had less of an influence in the larger jury. If we were to, to make changes um, to various features of the, the Scottish system, you see 
those summarised on the slide. Um, I'm not going to, to read those those out again because I, I, largely the points I've, I've covered in the, the, the discussion. Uh, I suppose the, the one point we haven't mentioned at all is we did ask jurors about the satisfaction with the process. Uh, one thing we did about the not prone verdict is that jurors were more satisfied with the experience of being a juror if they had the option of not, pro not proven available to them, which was interesting. Okay, at that point, I'm going to hand over to Fiona. Okay, so do I do I share my screen at this point, or are you going? I think to... that's probably easier, unless you want me to actually your glamorous assistant and and control it for you. <laughs> no, you're okay. Right. Okay. So this is going to involve swapping over. So if you stop sharing yours, I start sharing mine. Um, bear with me a sec. Right. Okay. Um, to keep bearing with me because this oh. <laughs> um hang on this is going well right let's let's go with that shall we i can only see my screen and i can't see any of you but maybe that's a maybe that's a good thing um i did notice actually before i start a question came up on the chat which is is the not proven verdict unique to scotland um, and the answer is yes, it is unique to Scotland. Nowhere else, as far as we know, um, has the not proven verdict um, completely unique to Scotland. So, okay. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about two things. I'm going to talk about how our jurors understood the not proven verdict. Um, and I'm also going to talk about what we found in relation to the rape deliberations. So if we start with understanding of not proven, um, there we go. So the jurors were directed on the not proven verdict by the judge. Um, I should say that's only if they were actually in, um, in the condition where they had three verdicts available to them. The jurors were who only had two verdicts were not told anything about the not proven verdict. But for the jurors that had the not proven verdict available to them, um, they were basically given what was then the standard Scottish direction on the not proven verdict, which is up on the screen just now. Um, essentially, that there are two verdicts of acquittal, they both have the same effect. Um, and jurors are not told anything else about not proven and not guilty other than that, and that's standard practice. So, what did they say about? not proven during the deliberations? Well, I think the first thing is they didn't say an awful lot. Um, certainly the meaning and consequences of not proven were very rarely discussed at any length, even in those juries where that verdict was actually returned. But where they did discuss it, there was a fair degree of uncertainty about the verdict and what it meant. You got in some juries, jurors actually asking each other, what does it mean? Um, saying that they don't understand it. I think in at least one case, they came out and asked the researchers, because we weren't obviously present in the room, came out and asked the researchers what it meant um, and said they didn't understand the meaning of the verdict. Now, the, the way the research worked is we didn't tell them. We just said, well, you have to go back and think about the trial judge's directions. And what they were really confused about perhaps not surprisingly, was just how not proven differed from not guilty. They kind of felt there ought to be some difference, but they didn't understand what that, what that was. They very rarely, though, expressed beliefs about the verdict that, are actually, that were actually incorrect. Um, and that's not surprising, really, because as we've already seen, the not proven verdict doesn't actually have a specific definition beyond it simply being one of the two acquittal verdicts. Um, there were occasionally genuinely incorrect views expressed, so probably the best example of that is that some jurors thought that the difference between not proven and not guilty was that for if you got a not guilty verdict you couldn't be prosecuted again, whereas after a not proven verdict actually you could be the subject of another prosecution. Now that's not true. That's the, the position is exactly the same in relation to the two verdicts. So that came up a few times. But apart from that, people genuinely didn't say anything that was legally wrong. And that is, as I say, just because it does, doesn't really have a legal definition. 
And that does leave room for a whole range of different understandings about the verdict's meaning um, and its purpose. And we saw all sorts of things coming up in the deliberations. So if I just move on to that. So what we found, I think, really was probably four main understandings of not proven that arose in the deliberation. So when jurors talked about the verdict, what, what did they say about it? Um, and the first one is that jurors sometimes saw it as a kind of compromise verdict, where if they were finding it hard to reach agreement, um, then they would go for not proven as a kind of compromise position that allowed the jury to actually return a verdict. And sometimes actually in the juries where they didn't have the not proven verdict, you would sometimes get jurors who were aware of its existence and would say, oh, I wish we had it. It would be a lot quicker for us to actually, or a lot easier for us actually to reach agreement if, if we did have it. The second understanding that arose just below that is this idea that you should use not proven if the accused hasn't proved his or her innocence. Um, now, of course, the accused doesn't have to prove his or her innocence. But again, this is an example of jurors kind of using the verdict where they were kind of unsure. They weren't sure whether the accused was innocent or guilty and just felt that they didn't know whether or not the accused was innocent, which, as we'll see in a moment, the not guilty verdict was used in a rather different way. But I think by far and away, the most common understanding that came up was this idea that the not proven verdict is the verdict you use when you think the accused is guilty, but you don't feel the case has been proved beyond reasonable doubt. Um, that came up certainly as the most common theme that arose in, in the deliberations. And related to that, jurors often felt there would be a bit of a lingering stigma over somebody who walked away with a not proven verdict. Um, as, as the juror here says, you walk away innocent, but everyone knows. So those were kind of really the four things that arose most commonly in the deliberations. And I'd stress again that none of them are actually legally wrong. Um, if you think somebody's guilty, but you don't think the case has been proved beyond reasonable doubt, well, actually, an acquittal verdict is the legally correct option. But what you can see here is that understandings did vary. Jurors weren't always kind of thinking about it in, in the same way. Um, and what you also saw, as I'll show in a moment, is that there was a difference between how the jurors thought about the not proven verdict compared to how they thought about the not guilty verdict. So if we just have a quick look at this slide, this is... Um, these are the reasons, or this, this is based on the reasons that jurors gave for choosing either a not proven or a not guilty verdict. Now, this, these are just from um, the, the juries where they had both verdicts available to them. Um, there is a bit of a health warning over this because jurors, um, you know, I think before I kind of listened to these deliberations, I, I've never been on a jury and I kind of maybe thought that jurors would be a bit more, um, I don't know, kind of coherent in their reasons for choosing different verdicts. And that's not really what we found at all. It was actually quite difficult sometimes to work out why people had chosen one verdict over another verdict. So jurors didn't often say why they'd chosen not proven compared to, compared to not guilty. But when they did, um, there were distinct differences. So the two reasons why people or jurors stated that they had chosen a not proven verdict, tended to be either because they thought the accused was guilty, but the case hadn't been proved beyond reasonable doubt, as we've seen already, or they just found it difficult to choose between two conflicting accounts. And if you contrast that to, on the right-hand side, the reasons why people said they'd chosen a not guilty verdict, it tended to be either because they genuinely thought the accused was innocent, um, or because they thought that one or more of the Crown witnesses were lying. So a real difference there in why people were going for not proven and not guilty verdicts, or at least where they gave a reason for that. Okay, so moving on then, the last thing that I will just say a little bit about is how the jurors 
um, went about their deliberations in the rape trial. So this, as James said, wasn't officially part of the research. Um, the Scottish government had no objection to us doing this, but it wasn't one of their research questions. But because we had a huge data, well, huge, a large data set of deliberations in rape trials, we were able to also um, just make some observations about how the jurors were discussing the rape trials. So we had 32 juries who watched the rape case and deliberated over it. And we had videos and transcripts of their deliberations in all of those 32 trials. And what we did here was we went through those transcripts and just looking for evidence of some of the more kind of problematic attitudes that are sometimes, um, well, certainly there's a body of research, we're not the first to do this, a body of research that has demonstrated that in mock jury trials, jurors can sometimes be um, influenced by so-called rape myths, um, myths about how complainers, rape victims might behave or what real rape looks like that are, that are untrue. And so we went through our transcript um, just to see what evidence we could find of these, these myths, these attitudes arising in our deliberations. Um, and we both quantified the extent to which these views were expressed. We looked at whether they were challenged or not, and just looked in a little bit more detail at what, what, people, were, what people were saying. As I said, we are not the first to do this. Um, Vanessa Munro, in particular, one of our co-researchers has run several mock jury studies looking at um, the extent to which rape myths kind of come up in, in jury deliberations. Um, but this is the largest study that's ever been done on this. And so we're able to kind of, well, the, 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 the kind of the, the main finding is that we're able to confirm that they come up a lot um, in now quite a large study. So let's... Um, should say before we move on to, to looking at kind of what jurors were saying, there are limitations to this work. Now, some of them are similar to the limitations that James spoke about at the beginning about the, about the research as a whole. So there's the issue of the fictional trial, um, but there are further limitations. So we only used a single rape trial scenario, which I'll say a little bit about in just a moment. So we can describe how jurors reacted to that scenario um, but what we can't say is what difference anything made. So, for example, obviously in our scenario, there was a requirement for corroboration and jurors had various views about that. Um, but what we can't say, because we didn't run a simulation where there was no corroboration requirement, we can't say what difference that made or that might have made to the deliberations. And then obviously this, um, this is all based on what jurors said during the deliberations. That's all we can really go on. We don't know what jurors who remained silent were thinking. Um, so that is a limitation of, of the research as well. But setting all that aside, or at least bearing it in mind, what did we find? Well, um, actually it might make sense at this point to say a little bit about what, very briefly, what our, our trial scenario was. So in our scenario, um, this is a real test of my memory, actually, because it's a long time since we did this research. But in our scenario, you had, um, James will put me right if I go wrong. We had the complainer and the accused had been in a relationship, and that had ended, um, I think, about eight months ago. And there's had very little contact since then. But on the night in question, he had come up to her flat to collect um, a television that he had left there when they broke up. And they had a reasonably civil conversation. They had one glass of wine together. It was incredible how much that one glass of wine sometimes got exaggerated by our jurors who often had them steaming drunk. Um, but what happened was when he got up to leave, um, they kissed and that's where their accounts diverged. So at that point, she, the complainer says that she was raped, um, but the accused claims that their sexual intercourse was consensual. And the evidence that we had is we had the complainer giving evidence and we had the accused also giving evidence. 
But then as James said earlier, we also had a medical examiner and she had examined the complainer in the aftermath of what happened. And she found, if I can remember, she found significant bruising to the complainer's inner thighs and also her chest, I think. And she had scratches on her breast. She didn't have any internal injuries, but the medical examiner testified that this is not unusual where people have been have been subjected to forced sexual intercourse. So that's the scenario. Um, what did we actually find? Well, we found considerable evidence of problematic and false beliefs expressed in the deliberations. Um, this first one here refers to the idea that if somebody, if a, a, a rape victim doesn't physically resist the attack, that this is somehow an indication of consent. And we found that this, this view was expressed at least once um, in 28 of the 32 juries that we ran. You can see some of the, some of the quotes there. It didn't go unchallenged. Um, in 22 of those 28 juries that expressed the view, it was challenged again by at least one juror. Um, but these views were very common and there's little evidence of where the views were challenged that this actually made any difference to the person who, the person who expressed the view in the first place. Similar to that, um, we found that the belief that a genuine rape victim would be expected to scream or call for help was expressed in um, half of our 32 juries. Um, now, in our scenario, no evidence was presented of any um, of the complainers screaming or calling for help. Um, I can't even remember if she was asked about this, but it would probably have been futile anyway, because they were, they were in a flat. Um, but as I say, the, the belief that the victim would be expected to kind of shout and scream and call for help was expressed in half of the juries. Whereas actually, um, research shows that the way that people respond to terrible trauma is very varied. Um, there's actually, it's a very common reaction to simply freeze and not be able to struggle and not be able to call out at all. Again, this view didn't go unchallenged, um, but it was challenged less often than, than claims about the absence of physical resistance. One thing that did come out of this though, is that where it was challenged, often jurors, or not often, it wasn't challenged very often, but the jurors that did challenge it, um, pointed either explicitly or implicitly to a campaign run by Rape Crisis Scotland, the I Just Froze campaign, um, which does show that these, the, the campaign was to some degree, some degree successful. Then, um, well, James has actually said a little bit about, about this already, but the, the way that corroboration affected the deliberations Jurors or some jurors did tend to misunderstand the corroboration standard. So as I said, we had the, the evidence of the complainer that she had been raped, and we also had the medical examiner's evidence, and legally that's sufficient to um, fulfill the corroboration requirement. Nonetheless, in 23 of the juries, you had at least one juror expressing the view that you didn't have sufficient evidence for conviction. This is because they believed that the medical examiner's evidence had to be absolutely um, uncontrovertible um, in order to suffice to corroborate the complainer's evidence. And we didn't have that. Um, what we had was the medical examiner basically saying that her injuries, the complainer's injuries were consistent with forced sexual intercourse, but that she couldn't completely rule out other possible explanations. Again, this view was sometimes challenged, the, the view that the medical, um, the medical examiner's evidence wasn't sufficient. And when, when jurors did that, they often tended to do it in a kind of rhetorical way to kind of say, well, if that's not enough, then how on earth do you ever prove a rape case? Um, what we can't tell, though, is how much of this is actually to do with the corroboration requirement? In other words, if there was no corroboration requirement, would you still get jurors saying, well, the evidence isn't enough? And we simply don't know that. I suspect it doesn't make that much difference. 
but because we didn't run the two parallel scenarios, we can't we can't say that with any with any degree of certainty. The this is this is where as well that the two bits of the research kind of collide because what you found sometimes is the jurors who were unconvinced that the evidence was sufficient would choose the not proven verdict as a kind of compromise approach. Um, and what you saw sometimes as well, you can see in the last quote there, um, didn't come up very often, but sometimes you had jurors who said, well, maybe if we go for a not proven verdict, this might send, might be a kind of better outcome for the complainer than a not guilty verdict and might send the message that, you know, we're not necessarily saying we don't believe her. Um, we're simply saying that just the case hasn't been proved beyond reasonable doubt. Now, if that is a message that jurors are trying to send, Vanessa Munro has done some research that shows with real rape complainers that shows that who have had not proven verdicts, um, that shows it's not really a message that they appreciate. Um, I think what complainers really want is a guilty verdict. But some jurors did kind of think, well, a not proven verdict is a good compromise and it's kind of kinder to the complainer than the not guilty verdict. And then, Finally, I think, because I can't see what's coming next, but finally, um, just a little bit about false allegations. It came up in 19 of our 32 juries. Um, there was at least one juror who basically claimed that false rape allegations are either common or routinely made, or words to that effect. Um, they came up with all sorts of different motives for why the complainer might be making a false allegation. Um, they usually centered around her somehow being obsessed with the accused and out for revenge because he had broken up with her. Now that really wasn't supported in the evidence. Um, evidence was given that they'd only had contact with each other twice in the previous eight months. She certainly hadn't been texting him or phoning him or anything like that. Um, but some jurors did come up with this kind of strange narrative where she was making up the rape allegations because somehow she wanted to get back at him um, because he had rejected her. Some jurors went so far as to suggest that the complainer's injuries might actually be self-inflicted, um, which again really was not suggested by the evidence at all. Um, but they tied that in to kind of the false allegations um, narrative. The, the idea didn't go unchallenged. Um, so the view that false allegations were common was challenged in at least some of the cases where it was made. Um, and people just really just, jurors really just saying, you know, it, it's a very, it's a very extreme way of trying to get revenge against somebody by actually going through with a, going through with a rape case all the way to the end. Um, but again, there was very little evidence that these challenges really made any difference to people who held the original view that false allegations are, are widespread and, and common. So that does bring us to the end. So really just to sum up kind of the, the, the rape deliberations aspect of it all. There was this persistent focus on real rape victims having extensive injuries and always resisting to the full and screaming out if they were being raped. Um, there was a lack of clarity over the extent to which a medical expert could corroborate the complainer's account and some credence given to the idea that rape allegations are often unfounded, that complainers are often making it up. However, it's not all negative. Um, there was also evidence of a willingness for other jurors to challenge people's attitudes, people's problematic attitudes. Um, they did sometimes actually refer to judicial directions in, in doing this. And also to, as I said, the Rape Crisis Scotland, I Just Froze campaign. So I think that is, is that the end? Yes, that is the end. So I'm going to stop sharing and